The gospel today is, is from the, the fourth chapter of Luke, and we're going to read uh, the first part together. It's kind of long, so I'll, I just divided it up, so I'll read the second part, uh, and you guys can, can, can listen while I do that, but we'll start together. Okay, Kevin. Let's, let's begin. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did at Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his own t- hometown. I think I'll, I'll continue then, okay? I'll, I'll just finish this up for us. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. We continue this little series. We started last week. It's called If, Then, okay, and it's logical answers to big questions. All right, that's that's the series, logical answers to big questions. Uh, And and, uh, today we're going to ask that question, if Christmas is real, then what does this mean for us? Do we have the next slide or not, Kevin? No, okay. So um, if you remember the... um, uh, uh, the kicking off point for this, if you will, is to understand that, um, that, that God has made us as people who can reason and think and, and who can logically think things through. Uh, all the people, all the kids in the class are 10 years old. Johnny is in the class, therefore Johnny is... Yeah, it's not tough, is it? A dog can't do that, though. A horse can't do that. We can do that. We were created to think and to reason and to use logic. Uh, and and as, I, as I mentioned la- last week, this doesn't mean that the things of God or even our, existent, or, uh, even our existence are not, uh, do not have great mystery about them, right? Everything around here is mostly empty space and yet we exist. How can that happen? God is a triune God, three persons, yet one God. Uh, how, how can that be? It's too big, it's, that's a too big of a thing for our little pea brains, right? So there's mystery, but God never asks us to put our brain on the shelf. He never asks us to, to, to believe that black is white or white is black. But by the way, if, if someone actually asks you to do that and they're tied to a, uh, a religious organization, that, that's really, uh, I, I believe, a, a stamp of, of a cult. Someone that, that, that they're unhealthy and they're, they're asking you to put your brain on the shelf. That, that God never asks us to put our brain on the shelf. There's always great mystery. All right? we, we always walk by faith. Uh, but, but he never asks us, uh, for instance, he never asks us to believe uh, that, that Jerusalem was there if it wasn't there. Okay, it was there. We, know, we can go visit it right now. Huh? He never asks us to believe stuff that, that just, uh, just smacks us in the head and makes us turn our brain on. Um, and, and so as we're going to look at some big questions and we're going to use reason, all right? And, and, and we're, going to, uh, we're going to say, can, can reason support this? And then we can say, okay, if this is true, then, then what does this mean? Then what, what does this mean for our life? Okay? So as I said, the, um, uh, the question we're going to ask today is if Christmas is real. Now, as I mentioned, I, in, in our home, we've, we've got the uh, Christmas stuff put away. Is your stuff put away? Is your stuff? Yeah. And, and Christmas is kind of, yeah, what's that? Still have your lights up? Do you, do you leave them on year-round? No, never, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, anyway, most of us have it put away. And certainly it's kind of behind us, right? We, we, uh, it's, it's, it's not there anymore. And, and, and like I say, I, I, I wasn't fooling the kids. I really couldn't remember what I got for Christmas this year. And I got new, neat stuff. I love those shoes and I love, you know, all that stuff, but I, I'd forgotten it. It's just that, that I, I'm on the next thing, right? All, all, all the time. 
Um, and, and in fact, as I have to admit, as I look back at Christmas this time, I, I have to confess to you that I, I really uh, kind of abdicated what I should have been doing as, as, uh, as a father and, and husband a little bit. And, and Jane kind of just picked up the slack, and she was awesome. And yet, as I look back, it, 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 everything I was doing, it kind of took hold of me, and I was in a whirlwind. And so I wasn't really present you know, you, you talked about being present, with, and I, I wasn't really there. I was just doing stuff. Does that ever happen with you at Christmas? Yeah, in fact, with life, it sometimes does. But so, so this is a this is a question I think for me that's that's important. If Christmas is real, and I look back and I say, oh man, I, I really wasn't there at, at Christmas, and, and and then I can't remember what I got, and and um, uh, even the gifts I gave, I really have to think about. It. And so. Just what, what is Christmas, anyway? I think when you ask this question, if Christmas is real, uh, understood there is the question, well, what makes it real? Does that kind of make sense? And that, that's where I think this text uh, kind of ties into our lives. This text begins like this. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Jesus is speaking. Now, I, I need to set this up for you, okay? Uh, Jesus, his ministry has been going on about a year. And, and he's been uh, healing and, and, and he has been uh, 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 speaking, do, doing miracles, saying wonderful things as he opens the, the word of God to people. In fact, he's in Nazareth right now. And he, uh, remember the first miracle? He changed the water into wine. Remember at Cana? Cana's about eight miles from Nazareth, okay? And, and Nazareth was his hometown. So the people in Nazareth, they, they, they were getting famous because of, because of their buddy Jesus, right? I mean, it, it was a really, I, I'm sure it was good for business. I, I don't know if they were selling souvenirs or not, but maybe they were, right? Hey, here we go. This is the place Jesus lived. Get a stone from his house, the guy that turned water into wine. I have no idea. All I know is they were really excited to have him there, right? Uh, and, and when Jesus came, it was a Sabbath, and, uh, you know, just, just uh, an aside here. It says it was Sabbath, and it says that Jesus was going to worship as was his custom, uh, which I, I really think is, is awesome, because here he is, here is Jesus, the Savior of the world, the only begotten Son of God, as we'll see, and yet he worshiped one in seven. He did that one in seven thing. I, I think it's really nice for us, as, as, as we're struggling with that in our lives, in our busy lives, you know, Jesus did it, and it was good for him. Probably it's good for us. Yeah, that's just an aside, but, but I, just, I just love to throw that out because it always smacks me in the face whenever I read that. So anyway, G- Jesus was there, and he was there to worship, and they gave him the scroll. They, they said, oh, man, here's the hometown kid made good. And they gave him the scroll of Isaiah, and he opened it up, and, and, and this is what he read. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach uh, good news to the poor. This is actually a prophecy from Isaiah about 700 years before Jesus came, and it's, it's prophesying what the, the coming Savior or Messiah, Messiah means the one who is anointed, okay, what he would do. So it says, the Lord is on me. He has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He's going to preach good news. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, freeing us from sin, right, and recovery of sight for the blind. He's going to open our eyes so we can see stuff to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the year of the Lord's grace. That word favor means it's the same word as translated grace. So the year of the Lord's grace. And he says, he, and, and he reads this, and, and, and they're looking for him to comment on it. And the first thing he says is, today this scripture is fulfilled in your learning. Now he says some other stuff too, because it says well, he began to speak, but the most important thing was, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus was not simply saying, I'm doing all these things. He was saying, I am this guy. That's what he was saying. I am this guy. And the response he got was this. All spoke well of him. His hometown kid made good, right? All spoke well of him. And they were amazed at his gracious words. He was talking about grace, right? Talked about the favor, the grace of the Lord. And they said, oh, this is cool stuff. But they didn't like him saying, this is fulfilled in your hearing. They didn't like him saying, I am this guy. And so they said, wait a minute, isn't this Joe's kid? Isn't this a guy that just grew up down the block? Isn't this guy that was going to be a carpenter just like his daddy? Now, you might want to, you might be sitting there thinking, what's this all have to do with Christmas past? You might want to ask me that. Why don't you ask me that? What's this all have to do with Christmas past? Why don't you go? I'm glad you asked that. Okay. <laughs> we look at uh, Matthew. Go ahead. 
talks about Christmas in Matthew 1. It says, The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means... That's the point. That's what Christmas is. It's not just about what this one would do, but who he is. He's God with us. And in Luke, where the, the, the large, the long story of Christmas is that we, all, we read all the time, Luke 2, in, in, that, in that book, in Luke 1, it says this. Go ahead, Kevin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called... You get that? Christmas is about God stepping into our world. It's about us understanding he's not just Joe's kid. But he's God with us. We need that. (laughs) The story that God tells us in his word is it rings with truth. He says everything's broken. And we can't fix it. That does kind of ring with truth, doesn't it? My life's broken. How's yours doing? As I look at the history of humankind, all I see is brokenness. And, and you know, it's not getting better. The last hundred years, humankind has killed more humans than, than all the other years put together. Did you know that? Things are broken and we're not fixing them. We need God to come and help us. That was what the prophets prophesied. That this one would be the seed of the woman. Right, Genesis 3, the seed, it didn't say the seed of man, the man and the woman, it said the seed of the woman, right? Christmas is about the Son of God stepping into our world. And he comes as the King of kings and Lord of lords who could demand us to worship him. But instead, he compassionately offers us grace and invites us to have life the way it was meant to be in relationship with him and through him with God and with one another. All right, let's let's do some logic thinking, huh? All right, uh, I, I want to just I, I want to just hit some of these points. We we said each each Sunday here for a while we're going to get our logic involved, see if, see if it makes sense. And, and and I've talked about this before, but but the first thing I'd hold up for you is is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the primary source materials. All right, now this is what I mean by that. And you've heard, some of you heard me say this before, but but if you wanted to know about what it was like to fight in the Battle of Bull Run. Would you rather read a history book written 100 years after the time or would you rather read a diary of a guy that was there and did that? Yeah, the diary, right? He was there. He experienced it. He can tell you this is what it was like because I was there. I did it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are primary source materials written by people who were there or those who were close to them. And it wasn't written 100 years after the fact, or 500 years after the fact, or 1,000 years after the fact. It was written at some time in the 50s or 60s or 70s. Nobody thinks it was written any later than that. See, now Jesus, he's about 33 when he died. Yeah, so he, and I, I know that birth thing, he's probably a few years A.D. or B.C. when he was born, but still roughly 30, right? So, so you got when, 20, 30, 40 years after the, after, after the deal. And this the information is being passed around orally from years before that. Anyone, thousands of people could have stood up. Remember, this is, these were articles of faith for them. Thousands of people would have stood up and said, no, you don't have it straight, if indeed they didn't have it straight. Primary source material. I was with the uh, a council yesterday. Uh, uh, we took a little excursion. And we, we were talking, and, and one of them said, you know, Pastor, last week you talked about Josephus. He was a, a Roman historian. He's a Jewish guy, a Roman historian. He says, you didn't mean to say that, that Josephus... Uh, um, proved that the, that the Gospels were right. And I said, of course not. Josephus was written 100 years after that. Maybe not 100 years, 50 years after that, right? He wasn't a primary source material guy. All we were trying to show is that the history people of the time also knew these things that occurred, the people that wrote history. But the primary source materials are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This last, uh, in the first service, people, a couple of people came out and they said to me that they had had lunch with another Christian uh, and this Christian has said to them, well, you know, you can't believe, nothing in the Bible can, is, is true, really. And that's what they said. You can't be sure anything's true in the Bible. And, and honestly, I'm going, ah! And I'm not going, ah! Because I disagree with him. 
You see, what really bothers me is the lack of logic, the dishonesty. Look at the facts. Primary source materials written in the 50s, 60s, or 70s, thousands of manu ancient manuscripts, 50,000 main ancient manuscripts, 5,000 of them papyrus. So close to the original in time that, so that we absolutely know we have what was first written. And they were written by eyewitnesses. I'm not making this stuff up. And it's not just the Gospels. Go ahead, Kevin. It, it, it extends into the whole Bible, really. I'm sorry, I, I, I skipped my... So l l last week, I, um, I, I talked about the witness of archaeology, and, and I just want to just touch this point real quick, because I, I talked about it last time. I want to touch on this point because of Luke. Luke's the one that's got the big Christmas story, right, when Quirinius was governor of Syria and all this. Day. He's, he's the Luke guy. And, and he also wrote Acts, and, a, and a one archaeologist... In, in looking at Luke, he looked at his reference to 32 countries, 54 cities, nine islands, and he says there's not a mistake here. You see the logic here? If Luke was a historian, that's what he said he was. he was. He interviewed people and he wrote down what the truth was. He was pretty stinking accurate. It's pretty good evidence to say what he wrote was true, right? All right, now let's, let's look at the other text just real quick here. <sighs> Galatians was written probably very early, 48 maybe. That's not very long after the fact. And, and, and this is found in Galatians. And virtually all of the New Testament talks about this thing about Jesus being the Son of God. But, but look at this. It says, but when the fullness of time had come. When was he talking about? He was talking about Christmas, guys. In that point in time, when Quirinius was governor of Syria and Jesus was born, that's the fullness of time. God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Not a man and a woman. A woman. It's the witness of all of the writers. It's also the witness of the ancient prophecies written 700 years, 1,000 years before Christ. Put the next one up for me, Kevin. I almost didn't, didn't add this one, but I, I wanted to throw it in. Common sense logic. Uh, I've talked about the corrective, of people, the corrective of people who would still be alive, okay? But, but also the stories that other folks made up. Now think about what's proven by these things. They made up the story that, um, that Mary might have had a relationship with a Roman soldier. Now, now, now think about this. Think about this with me for a minute. Do you think she would have survived? It wouldn't only have been adultery, it would have been treason. You think she would have survived? Do you think Joseph would have married someone who was a traitor to his people? It doesn't make any sense, does it? Do you think Jesus would actually have been accepted? See, when somebody tells a lie, it says something happened here, and, and, and we've got to say something happened that didn't. But what we, what we know is that something did happen. It's the same thing with the resurrection. They say, oh, the body must have been stolen. You know how stupid that is? The tomb was guarded by a, by a crack group of, of Green Beret soldiers. You think somebody's going to steal the body? That's stupid. It makes no sense. So even the stories of the enemies of the faith logically tell us that something went on here that they had to make stories about it. The last thing, and, and I'm almost done with this section, the last thing is to look at Jesus himself. He did things o only God could do. Raised the dead. Made the blind see. People that were blind from birth. He claimed to be God himself. He said in John 10, I am the Father at one. When you go home today, look up John 10 and read the rest after John 10:30. After he said, I and the Father are one, see how that ends. Don't take my word for it, but I'll, I'll tell you how it ends. He, the, the, the people, they, want, they took up stones to kill him. He said, why do you want to kill me? He says, because you, just a mere man, are making yourself out to be God. That's what the text says. They knew exactly who he was claiming to be. And I think the resurrection from the dead, his resurrection, proves that what he said was true and who he said he was, was true. What do you guys think? Okay. 
if Christmas is real, and that means if God became a human being, right? if that's true, what does it mean for us? I think in this Luke text that, that, that we're looking at, the, the, the thing that, that jumps out at us is that when the, guy, when the people said, oh, this is Joseph's son, Jesus would not allow that to stand. In fact, he told this story. He told this story about Elijah, who was a prophet of God, and Elisha, who was a prophet of God, and the people of the day wouldn't receive him as prophets of God, so they went somewhere else. They went actually to Gentiles, who would receive them as the prophets of God. The people hated that. They didn't like the idea that they had to receive who they were and who Jesus was by faith before anything else could happen. Jesus did not allow them. And this was not because he hated them, but because he loved them. He had, he had to show them that Christmas was to receive him as the Son of God. Because only through that can there be relationship with God the way it was meant to be. C.S. Lewis wrote this a long time ago. C.S. Lewis, about two generations ago, famous Christian writer, he wrote this. You can call Jesus crazy, a lunatic. You can call him a liar, or you can fall down and worship him as the Son of God, your Savior and the Savior of the world. You get that? You can't call him the, the son of Joseph. Just like he didn't let the people in our story do that, he doesn't let anybody do that. It's illogical. But you cannot simply call him a good man, one among many. God did not leave this open to us, and he did not intend to. Christmas means that Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. It's not simply about what he did, but who he was when he did it. The Son of God reaching out to us to fix things when we couldn't. The Son of God connecting us to God again, that we might have life the way it was meant to be in relationship with him and through him in relationship with others. Philippians text. Philippians text. Um, oh, no, no, no. It's the one before this. All right. And this is our last one. Okay, Kevin? All right. The Philippians text takes this a step further. It's not simply uh, knowing Jesus is Lord, but what does it mean in our life? It starts like this. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Your attitude. Your example. You see... Christmas is not simply about Jesus being Emmanuel, God with us, but it's an example that he gives us. And this is the example. Would you read this with me? Who, being in the very nature of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Just stop. Being made in, what is that talking about? What's the point in time when that happened? Christmas. Christmas becomes not only the place where God steps into our world for us, but the place where he gives us this wonderful, this wonderful model for living as a servant. God became our servant in Jesus. He went the way of the cross in our place. We have everything we need in him. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't need anything. And through him, we also can be servants in our lives. Servants in every relationship with, with our husbands and wives and, and, and moms and dads and our children. Servants as we, as we receive and grasp the mission that we're on. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Servants, in every moment, in every place he takes us, we can find that when we lose our life, we find it. Christmas, finally, is about God being with us to receive from him, but also to live in him as servants. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in true faith to life never-ending. Amen.
We stand and we confess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.